Hi everyone, or anyone. Welcome back to In the Nick of Time. This is episode two, and today's discussion topic is going to be on toxic positivity. I think I would just like to talk about the current role, especially involving new forms of media, obviously, namely social media, and the role that toxic positivity plays on there. But also in our society, what we've kind of grown accustomed to, what is a safe topic and what is a non-safe topic for people who are maybe struggling and putting a sort of artificial positivity band-aid or plaster is uh, over kind of every situation is, is not the answer. But I have a little word on a pet peeve of mine that um, I would like to discuss first, so let's just get right into it. This podcast is sponsored in part by Dion, which is a lifestyle and accessories brand founded in 2018. Offering carefully selected statement pieces, vintage and custom-made originals, bringing a little piece of art to your everyday. You can find them at d-e-o-y-n.com, that's dion.com, or on Instagram at Facebook to stay up to date. Thank you. So, my pet peeve for the week. (laughs) Um, Attention, new walkers. And that includes walkers that have taken it up during the pandemic, i.e. in the last year. Um... In the UK, we walk on the right-hand side of the road. If you didn't know this, that's where we walk, not the left, not the middle, but the right. And the reason that we walk on the right-hand side of the road is because we drive on the left. So pick up your highway code, because it's gonna tell you that the reason that we walk on not only the right-hand side of the road, meaning the correct-hand side of the road, therefore it's easy to remember, but the actual right-hand side of the road, because you can see oncoming traffic on your side of the road, which will protect you inevitably from death. So gone are the days where I move to the left-hand side of the road because you're walking on the left-hand side of the road against me. I am not playing a game of chicken with you, you know, where the monster cars drive towards each other and then the one that swerves out of the way is chicken. No, I will refuse and stop blank point range at you and not move. I don't care if you've got a puppy. I don't care if you've got a toddler. I don't care if you have a stroller or a pram. I'm not moving. If you've got a wheelchair, okay, I'll move. But I'm staying on the right-hand side of the road for my own safety and so that I can teach y'all a lesson, okay? I've been walking on this road, which doesn't have a pavement, by the way. If you have a pavement, walk on the pavement. But this road that I live on for the last 20 years, which I don't even know how that's possible because I wasn't even born six years ago, but I have earned the right to walk on the actual correct side of the road. And that's what I'm on do. But I just wanted to let you know, if you didn't know. And if you're running, same thing applies. Run against the traffic. Because you probably have your headphones in anyway, so you can't hear the car, but what's better than hearing the car is seeing the car and you will see it so much better walking on the right-hand side of the road. And I'm sure, respectively, in countries that drive on the right-hand side of the road, you walk on the left-hand side of the road because you will then be walking against traffic. I... Okay, now I got that straightened out, I'll get into toxic positivity. Clearly, I am not a toxic positivity person because I'm negative and (laughs) being like an old grandpa here ranting about you kids walking on the left hand side of the road you better pack it in um but nevertheless i've certainly succumbed to toxic positivity at times and um i think it's time to maybe call an end to it not low he has spoken nicholas is calling an end to toxic positivity but just opening a dialogue about it um i think is kind of important so the definition of toxic positivity is toxic positivity refers to the concept that focusing on so-called positive emotions and rejecting anything that may trigger negative emotions is the right way to live life. 
So already reading that, I think that like a little kind of red flag is going off in my head because at what extent do we take that to? I mean, <laughs> if I get mauled by a bear, my legs hanging off, I'm not going to be like, well, you know what? I can see some daffodils over there. I've got my breathing mantra with me. I'm just going to breathe through this and like... I, you know, I shouldn't be complaining. I'm sure a car crash would be more painful. Like, no, you're going to go to a hospital and you're going to scream out in pain because, ow. But um, obviously I don't think that many, unless you had some sort of psychological issue, would be, you know, saying positive mantras and live, laugh, love in the middle of your leg hanging off. I just mean that what I'm, tr well, yeah, what I'm trying to say is that the brain is not trained to keep us positive. The brain is trained to keep us surviving. It's trained to keep us alive. So I'm kind of using this analogy that with regard to mental health, if there's something wrong, positivity and the kind of brushing over everything with positivity is not going to fix anything. That kind of form of denial is not going to fix anything. The problem is likely, you know, is going to still be there. And so I guess the metaphor in saying that is positivity cannot solve everything. And I mean, can it even solve anything? Now, I understand we have kind of stereotypes on, even now, like I can think of my friend group if I was describing some of them. I mean, I once referred to a good friend of mine as terminally delightful or terminally optimistic or something like that because he's such a genuinely kind, lovely, upbeat person and although I think I'm generally quite positive I'm a little bit of a realist my sense of humor probably comes from being British but um, is certainly quite cynical and, and I guess self-deprecating and um, so I can even put friends in boxes of this is a critical friend and they're very funny because they kind of have this commentary on things and this is this person and putting everything into a box um, isn't useful. We're human beings. We all have different stages. Sometimes we're positive about certain aspects of our lives and negatives about um, other aspects of our lives, you know, whether it's we really like the way that we cook or we really hate the way that we do exams. I don't know. But I think, I mean, from personal experience, I've been told kind of all of my life like, you should be grateful, you know, you're fortunate to have these things. What do you know about life? Because you're younger. And none of that really helps. And the times that I've been told that as a young person, I've been told it by an adult from a different generation. And the reason I'm saying that is each generation has its own brand new set of problems. So applying a statement for every single problem that is outdated is unlikely to work, which is why I think that my friends talk to their friends about their issues and not their parents because there's a generational factor going on. Your friends are probably more likely to be able to relate to what you're going through, unless it's a family issue. But even then, yeah. um, then your parents, because your parents will have had to deal with other things that were tangible for them. And that's why we talk to our friends. And I guess we kind of make our own family through our friends. Um, I think the, the issue that we have with toxic positivity now, or at least another issue, should I say, is that at least in the UK, I can't really speak for other countries, we don't have any clue on how to talk about mental health. Now, do I think it's getting better? Yes. Mental health is being talked about sort of on a more equal level with kind of physical health. And even before COVID-19, we are having a pandemic of mental health, if you will. And I think it's been exacerbated through the pandemic because people haven't been able to see their therapists. People haven't been able to go to the doctor unless it's an emergency. 
lack of being able to see friends, lack of being able to socialize, lack of being able to, you know, walk around an art gallery and be peaceful in that kind of moment. It is all small things that make up a huge kind of chasm of problems with individuals. So I think the kind of going back to the language that we use in mental health in the UK, I think and it's still a very apparent issue, at least in what I see from many of my friends who are talking about, you know, HR at companies and talking about their mental health at work and it's kind of a taboo subject. And um, I think for many, unless you have a cold, you have a sickness bug, not many people are that willing to say they need a mental health day at their office or, I mean, any place of work. Um, and I think the culture with that sort of stems from this kind of burden word. I, if it's kind of a mental issue, I think that you view it as a burden and therefore you don't want to share it or burden someone else with your problems, which is a really terrible thing. And it's a very isolating thing that makes one, can, well, can, can drive people to complete solitude and loneliness in that and um, what I'll get on into it a little bit is kind of a, a non-experienced emotional state. Um, there are kind of a couple of different institutions that make this problem greater. I think um, while the NHS is amazing, it has had 11 years of being underfunded by a conservative Tory government Sorry that I'm getting political, but let's face it, it's 2021, everything is political. So if you don't want to hear it, sign off. Um, the underfunded NHS, I mean, I think wait times to see a counsellor for any type of cognitive behavioural therapy can be sort of six to eight months. And if you're kind of in a crisis situation, being told six to eight months on the waiting list approximately. I don't think that gives one much hope. And I mean, certainly when I've been to the doctor regarding mental health issues, um, there's an air of, am I taking someone's place here? Does someone deserve this more than I do? And that's a real kind of conundrum because it's back to that burden word again. I'm not trying to put people off going to the doctor, certainly not. And I mean, I think everyone should be in therapy. Just once a week, being able to talk to kind of an impartial individual to discuss your life, even if there's no kind of impending issue. And I know that's a very kind of romanticized statement. I just meant that if we lived in a perfect world, it would be lovely for everyone to be able to just offload their week on the therapist and um, be able to get some constructive mechanisms on how to deal with certain situations. Um, but if everyone was in therapy, I think therapy would, <laughs> the therapists would need therapists, the shrinks would need shrinks. Um, something that I was kind of noting down as I was putting together my little toxic positivity notes for this podcast is um, a good friend of mine told me something, and it's just something that popped into my mind, that I'd not heard in at the age at the time that I was, um, in 24 years, which is like, it's okay to be struggling and it's okay to talk about these things and you can talk about these things with me. So that number one and number two, because I have a tendency to sort of downplay what I'm going through because I don't want people to perceive me. And here's another, this means it's another issue as complaining number one and that I'm being somehow like spoiled in a way, which you may think of me, that's fine. What you think of me is none of my business. Um, but so I will say, well, I know I have, you know, I should be consider myself lucky and fortunate. I'm in this Western country, you know, I have these things in life and um, family, friends, all of that stuff. And she had said, just because you're fortunate doesn't mean it should diminish any other suffering that you're going through. And no one had ever told me, everyone had either told me that you don't know anything about life or that you 
couldn't possibly understand the complexities that come with adulthood. And, I mean, I don't want to be all, it gets better here, but I think that the regrets in my life that I have are things that I didn't do in younger age, which is kind of have a bit more chutzpah about me, which in the moments where I can, you know, like when you walk away from a fight and you're like, damn it, I should have said this, this is a really good line. But like, I look back on things and, and I regret the fact that I maybe didn't have the confidence at the time to stand up to people who were looking back. I'm like, that is so effed up. That is so out of line. Um, as a kind of young, scared, sensitive little child. Um, so it's great to have these people in your life that give you a different perspective and almost give you permission to struggle and have a moment of vulnerability, have a moment of shame even that is seen and not judged. And so in talking about Toxic positivity now, kind of that can't be said without bringing up social media. And I think, you know, good vibes only, no negativity here. I think a lot of people kind of read these things and think that they have to be positive the entire time. Um, I don't really... I think if I say good vibes only, I'm saying it um, ironically. Um, but I think what people... Um, I'm not going to say fail to understand, but sometimes perceive. Um, when something says no negativity, I think that they think it means that you can't look for help, ask for help, appear like you're suffering. But in reality, I think if we actually went down to the core of if I said no negativity here, it would literally be no non-constructive criticism. Like, don't just swear at me or say that, you know, you think I'm ugly or something. Um, how does that help me sort of question pops into my mind. I, that's where I would go with kind of no negativity. But I get that seeing good vibes only and stuff like that is toxic. Because I think the more that people talk on social media about their struggles, the more people will kind of come out of the fray and feel like they are less lonely, which is a major problem, especially in the last year. Um, so they are, there are people and there are accounts out there that do discuss uh, toxic positivity and they, people do discuss, you know, I've, I've, I um, follow someone that's documenting their eating disorder journey, which is obviously not, you know, look at my perfect life kind of thing. And I buy into the bullshit as well. I post all, you know, perfect things, edited selfies, um, things have a beauty filter on it. Look, look at my great life. And I think, I mean, when I'm posting, I'm not saying in my mind, look at my great life. I'm kind of thinking what a great way to kind of document what is happening that is good. But then there is a serious lack of the emotional connection to the times that I wasn't so good. And it's important, I think, to check back in the times when it wasn't so good, because then you can um, look at what you kind of came through and managed to overcome. And maybe it will help you in a time of despair um, to look back on the fact that you are strong and you could come through times of angst and darkness and when you're really up against it. So I think it's just important to know that. Um, a little fact and figure here, well not really, but um, the World Health Organization, as we all know, we've kind of uh, been listening to them or <laughs> some politicians haven't um, for the last year during the pandemic, but they have set, stated that the number one cause of disability is depression. And I was a bit shocked by that at first, but then I kind of thought about it and thought about how many days off work, how many times we can't leave the house, how many times we don't want to do this, and how many times you just wake up in that kind of pissy mood um, and realise that actually that is very, very true. 
And this, it, it, I think when I was reading through the paper, it was stating that um, most adults who have had issues with their mental health, it had started, I think, when they had become a teenager. So I can't remember the exact, exact age, but it was something like 13. So for me, obviously, 13, first year, you're a teenager. The thing that comes to mind is obviously hormones. So you're dealing with kind of a massive change from child to kind of adolescent and adult. But you also have mental health, which is something else that you're kind of adding to the pile that you're having to deal with at the time. And, you know, so the kind of redundant, oh, you don't know the struggle when you're young, when they're saying that most people's mental health issues start basically at high school age or um, middle high, whatever you call it in America, um, junior high. It's starting at a young age. So this kind of language that we're using with younger people is having massively detrimental effects. And I mean, I'm going to get into what we can do to help in a bit. Um, but I just think all of this is interesting and part of the kind of narrative, at least. Obviously, I've talked a little bit about professional help and, you know, my kind of romanticized, ridiculous, everyone should see a therapist line um, is in there. But I think that there's a huge stigma, at least uh, in the UK, around getting professional help. I think that it really takes um, a huge amount of strength and courage for not only admitting to yourself that you have um, an issue regarding your mental health, but to go and kind of bare your soul to a doctor or maybe someone that you're just confiding in, um, in itself is a huge feat. And it's not talked about enough that the, the kind of power of vulnerability and these are those major life events. Like I think that you fall in love with someone, not only in the romantic way, but um, in the platonic way that I'm speaking right now, more when they are vulnerable and they're showing that kind of real side of them. Um, because more than likely you can relate to how they're feeling. But I think the issue with the language use, or at least the stigma, is that it's just not helpful. I think for someone to say something like, oh, I would never take an antidepressant, um, is, I mean, it's already, like I said, it's already taken such strength for that person to ask for help, for you to then kind of poo-poo it and say that they should just, you know, pick themselves up by their bootstrap is, is just not the way to go. Switch of gears here a little bit. So when I talk about po toxic positivity, not toxic positivity, <laughs> Um, I think of a kind of, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, of a, a, an Instagram influencer. Um, they're on a beach in Bali and maybe they say positive vibes only in the caption or something like that while they're promoting, I don't know, glitter water or some <laughs> stupid thing. Um, and I'm thinking of kind of a plastered, fake, edited smile which is, I think, what toxic positivity again. Can I get some like stroke medicine right now? Toxic positivity. I think that's what where it where it's kind of based around this kind of artificial, sweeping, just be positive sort of thing. Um, and the reason that I'm saying that is because I don't think that when you are being kind of quote positive end quote all the time um, you're actually in touch with your emotional feeling state and I think that that is a huge issue because you're not I mean one might say well if you're not feeling negative feelings then that's great but I mean can you ever say that you were having a negative thought someone said oh well, just don't think about it and you actually went okay and just never thought about it again I mean it's ridiculous but in kind of reducing your emotional state to this positivity, I think that one is 
not allowing themselves obviously to feel the emotional side of things because they're just in their kind of surface um, brain. But if something actually positive happens, I don't think that people can sit in that positive moment because they are so positive, 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 positive. So if something actually positive happens, can you actually feel that? Can you actually enjoy that moment? Because there's, if we're thinking about like a graph, instead of going up and down, up and down, up and down with your emotions, if you're just level positivity the entire time, when an actually good event happens, perhaps it's numbing us, or at least numbing the ability to be able to relish and enjoy a good moment. Just something I'm thinking about. Now, I do think to an extent, every now and then, perhaps in a moment of maybe being a little bit spoiled about something, like, oh, someone ate my last, I don't know, star bar in the cupboard. <laughs> in a moment where you might be kind of like huffing and puffing about that, reminding yourself to be grateful for the things that you do have can improve your mood. So I'll say that about kind of being positive. Um, I think that it is not normal to be positive all the time. I mean, everyone has, like, I can literally wake up some days and it's just, I've woken up in a bad mood. That's just a fact. I mean, and some days it can feel like kind of the odds are stacked against you. You know, you wake up late, the alarm didn't go off or whatever, you know, I don't know, you're brushing your teeth and toothpaste goes down your navy blouse. Like, you gotta change, like, then you're late in traffic, then this happens, then your coffee spilled. Like, I can, I can feel that kind of moment, and it always happens on those days where you wake up a little bit pissy anyway. But, I mean, I just, I just, I think applying positive to those situations. Oh, well, the sun's out and then you get rained on. Oh, well, the plants are getting a water. Like, it's, it's too much, it's exhausting to try to be positive all the time. And I think, we're allowed every now and then to be grumpy. But then again, there's that word, allowed, permitted. Like, do you only get a certain amount of mental health days a year? I mean, where do we draw the line here? It's a very difficult subject, I think. But I think in my moments of panic attack or when I've been going through it, the I was just thinking what would actually comfort me and what has comforted me and these are maybe some ways that you can help others and hopefully it will translate and kind of what you give out will come back to you but I think I mean obviously it goes without saying I wouldn't tell someone and I'm saying greater you shouldn't tell someone just to be positive if they're kind of I guess bearing their soul to you or going through something that's been really challenging for them. I think physical contact, once it's safe, <laughs> um, after social distancing, if someone's telling you they're having a real issue, I think sometimes just giving a hug and actually holding someone and not giving one of those pat on the back hugs that are really annoying, um, an actual embrace can fully lighten the load to let because I think you can communicate physically sometimes and let people know that you're there for them and that you are listening. And that's kind of on to the next thing. I think that allowing people to talk about how they feel and just keep asking them how they feel and if they're kind of wanting to talk about something. Um, because that kind of without judgment, listening ear is so powerful and important. I guess what I'm trying to say is someone will listen. Um, and I have to practice what I preach sometimes because I might open up to one person and it gets a little shut down. So I might think, oh, well, I can't talk about that because I'll just get shut down. But someone will listen if you have an issue. And the support of good friends and family is a really valuable resource um, and I consider myself very lucky that I have some brilliant friends and, and a great family that have helped me through issues that I've had just as I have helped them.
And I kind of want to end on a question, maybe a bit of a hypothetical, which is, how do I feel? Ask yourself, maybe a little bit more often, how do I feel? And it may be a situation, how do I feel about that? Just a little mantra maybe to have in your head, which might spark, hopefully, if you aren't feeling so great, maybe you'll reach out to someone. Or maybe it's a situation where you feel that you can't say something, but perhaps being brave enough to share those inner thoughts, you might actually be heard and and seen a little bit more and your opinion kind of validated. You know, you might, it might be something going on with your family and you say something and then your sister jumps up and says, actually, I agree with this. So how do I feel? Just finally, some resources. Um, if you feel that you are really struggling at the moment and you are in crisis, um, first of all, if you follow me on Instagram or not, um, my DMs are always open and can come and say hello and I will have a chat with you. But if you are seeking more of a kind of professional plan with regard to having a a low moment, um, some resources are um, samaritans.org, which is a charity that has a range of kind of multimedia uses on the website. I think they have a hotline um, which you can visit. Um, the NHS Every Mind Matters website, mind.org.uk, which is another mental health charity. And if you're really feeling in a kind of severe critical mode of mental health, um, I would suggest dialing the non-emergency NHS 111 number. Um, and I'm sure they'll be able to put you in contact with someone who would help. It goes without saying, thank you so much for listening. Um, If you've made it this far, this podcast will be uploaded on YouTube. It will be published on the CastBox app for Android users and on the Apple Podcasts app for iOS users. Um, I'm looking into getting this up on Spotify And who knows, you may be listening on Spotify um, if I figured it out by the time I publish. So, yes, thank you for listening and I'll see you on episode three. Goodbye and stay safe.